Here is the physics paper two predictions video for 2025. Being predictions, we can only give our best guess. Um, but let's see how close we can get because the last two were pretty darn close. So first part that we need to be aware of is about magnets and magnetic fields. We need to understand that they have two poles uh, and how the like poles will repel from one another and the opposite poles will attract. Around the magnets, we are going to have a magnetic field where objects which are magnetic will experience the force. So force can be felt within that magnetic field. The magnetic field lines always travel from north to south. We also need to understand the terms permanent and induced magnets. Permanent magnets will always be magnetic, whereas induced magnets will only become magnetic when near another magnet, so within the magnetic field of another magnet. Final bit that's to do with magnets is electromagnets. Electromagnets are created by passing an electric current through a wire. Um, so when we do pass a current, a current I, um, through a wire, we're going to get a magnetic field around that. So we can use our right hand rule there to work out the direction of that. The thumb representing the flow of current and then the fingers curling around anti-clockwise to represent the magnetic field. Now, if we coil the wire into a coil, we get a solenoid and the same thing really. If we pass a current through that wire coiled round, we get a magnetic field around it, but that magnetic field is exactly the same as a permanent bar magnet. Now, in order to make these stronger, we need to be aware that there are different ways we can do that. We can increase the number of turns on the coil, so more coils. We could also increase the current. And we can place an iron core in there as well, which will make it much stronger. Now these points that I've just marked on there are where it is strongest. So it's always going to have the strongest magnetic field where the lines are closest together. So it's strongest at the poles. Now a section here that's only for hire is to do with Fleming's left hand rule. Um, and this kind of explains motor effect. This rule helps to determine the direction of the motion, which is represented by the thumb, the magnetic field, which is represented by the first finger. I've just highlighted the M there in thumb, F there in finger. And then in the second finger, I've highlighted the C. M meaning the movement of the wire, F representing the field, and then C representing the current. So the field is just the magnetic field, which will go from north to south, and then the current is flowing from positive to negative through the wire. And using that left hand rule, we can look at the effect of the current passing through the wire when it's in a magnetic field. So essentially the current causes a wire to experience a force within that magnetic field. And this is what we call the motor effect. This principle is basically for all electric motors. Next part that we're going to talk about is the electromagnetic spectrum. So here I've tried to draw a spectrum of waves and they will go from radio waves to microwaves infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and then gamma rays. Now, if we're looking at that spectrum from left to right, we can see here that it is decreasing in wavelength. Now, as we decrease the wavelength, this will cause an increase in the frequency and with a higher frequency, that means that we have a higher level of energy. Usually the higher energy waves will cause ionization. So that's where those atoms become ions. 
atoms becoming ions can potentially cause mutations in DNA and that could potentially lead to cancer. The larger wavelength waves have a lower amount of energy and that can cause localized heating uh, which can damage skin cells. You need to know the uses of each of these. So radio waves can be used for communication. Microwaves can also be used for communication, but for cooking as well. Infrared can be used in infrared cameras. Visible light can be used in fiber optics. UV can be used for tanning, which could potentially lead to cancer. The X-rays can be used for medical imaging. Again, their ionizing could, so could potentially lead to cancer. And then gamma can be used for medical treatment as well. All of these are traveling at the speed of light at 300 million meters per second, which is the constant. And we should be confident with using the wave speed equation, which is V equals F times lambda. Okay, so the next section that we're gonna talk about will be focusing on forces. Specifically in the first part, we will be talking about terminal velocity. The classic example with terminal velocity is when somebody is jumping out of a plane and parachuting. Terminal velocity is the maximum speed that an object will reach when falling through a fluid like air. So initially the object's weight is going to be greater than air resistance because it's greater, there will be a resultant force causing them to accelerate. As the speed increases, air resistance will also increase. Eventually, air resistance equals the object's weight. This causes the forces to be balanced, and that's when they reach terminal velocity. They're no longer accelerating, and that's because there is a resultant, resultant force of zero. Next part for forces will be about Hooke's law. So that's our F equals K times E equation there. This is to do with uh, using a spring and placing masses onto that, extending it by increasing the amount of force. And essentially what we need to understand is that when we apply a force to a spring, it will be directly proportional to its extension, which is why we get this graph here. Now, with most springs, there will be a limit of proportionality. This is where it will no longer go back to its original shape. And if it can't go back to its original shape, it is no longer behaving in what we call an inelastic, elastic way. And this is shown by that red line there where it's behaving direct, it's directly proportional. So as I increase the force, it increases the extension and then the extension increases much, much more. And that's because it's now past that limit of proportionality. So those two types of deformation I mentioned, elastic is when it goes back to its original shape. Inelastic is when it no longer returns to its original shape. It's gone past the elastic limit. Next section, really important section here is knowing Newton's laws of motion. The first law is the law of inertia. This is where an object will stay at rest or keep moving at a constant speed in a straight line unless a force acts on it. So here we have a ball with balance forces it has zero newtons of force, so that would continue at rest or at a constant velocity. Whereas here we can see that we have a ball with unbalanced forces and therefore it would accelerate to the right uh, with that resultant force. Newton's second law is just F equals MA. It explains the relationship between force, mass and acceleration. Basically bigger force, more acceleration. And then for Newton's third law, we've got every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the example here could be a rocket taking off. As the rocket is pushing, forcing gas downwards, there is an equal and opposite force pushing that rocket upwards. And that is what makes it rise through the air. 
Nice little simple section down at the bottom here, we're just talking about stopping distances in cars. You essentially need to be aware of the components for stopping distance. Stopping distance is made up of the thinking distance and the braking distance. Thinking distance is just how far a vehicle travels whilst the driver is reacting, so it's related to reaction time. Whereas braking distance is how far the car travels once the brakes have actually been applied. And there are some different factors here which will affect different things. Drinking, drugs, whether you're tired, these are all going to affect the reaction time, so the thinking distance. But the condition of the car, condition of the road, will affect braking distance. Speed will affect both of those. Very quick last one to add in here, which is specifically for hire, is about momentum. And you just have to consider really conservation of momentum and that momentum is always going to equal before and after. So momentum before is equal to the momentum after, whether that is a collision or that is an explosion. All right, final section. This is just for triples here. First part will be about transformers. So these are devices that will change the voltage of an electrical supply. And you can see here that we have a step up transformer. There are more coils on the secondary coil and therefore it will increase the voltage. And here below you can see we have a step down transformer. We have more coils on the primary coil and therefore the voltage will go down. Next section for triple will be to do with ultrasound. It's basically just consisting of sound waves with a frequency above 20,000 hertz, which is much too high for us to hear. You need to know its various uses, which will be medical imaging, so like baby scans, industrial testing to detect cracks in materials like pipes, and then sonar as well to detect depth underwater. The section that is in triple for hires will be to do with moments, which refer to the turning effect of a force around a pivot. According to the principle of moments, if an object is balanced, then you're going to have the clockwise moments equaling the anti-clockwise moments around that pivot. Examples can be like a spanner turning um, and a seesaw turning. You've got that pivot point in the middle there, or you've got the pivot point where the screw is or the nut is that you're trying to turn. Next section for triple will be for the lenses. Now within the lenses, this is all just to do with refraction, so that bending of light. You've got two lenses that you need to be aware of. You've got your convex lens, which is called a converging lens, so the light will converge. It brings the light rays together and they're used in devices like magnifying glasses and cameras. You can see here that we have the axis, we have the principal focus point here. The red is representing the light rays and then that distance between the middle of the lens and the principal focus is the focal length. Next is the concave lens. Concave lenses are diverging lenses, so this, it will spread light rays apart and they're often used in glasses for people who are short-sighted. So here we have the axis here, we have the light rays going through, diverging as they come out. Now that means that we're going to have our principal focus here. That distance there is again the focal length. We'll end up with a virtual image there. Now, key thing to remember is that convex lenses will only produce real images. And your concave lenses only produce virtual images. So just remember that the focal point is where 
the light rays meet after passing through the lens, principal axis is the straight line that goes through the center of the lens. Little section about pressure here, pressure in fluids. Um, so these are gonna be things like hydraulic systems. If you remember our equation, which is pressure equals force over area. These hydraulic systems use liquids and what that does is it takes advantage of the fact that you cannot compress a liquid to transmit a force. They're very effective because liquids do not compress and this means that the pressure can be transmitted evenly through the fluid. So the examples will be in brakes or in moving the diggers up and down uh, and hydraulic presses as well. So one of the coolest areas uh, about this triple content is the life cycle of a star, starting with a gas cloud, followed by a protostar. Then you have your main sequence star. Now if it's a small or medium star, you will get a red giant. You get a white dwarf and then a black dwarf. With large stars though, you're going to get a red supergiant. Followed by a supernova. And then you get two potentialities here. You get the neutron star or a black hole. Essentially what's happening here is it's a really dense pull of gravity, which is pulling all of that dust together. And then it heats up and begins nuclear fusion, which is changing throughout all of these different phases. When it runs out of fuel, it will then go down the different routes. And the final st stages essentially depend on the size of the star. Last two things that we've got here is to do with the Big Bang Theory and red shift where they're moving away and blue shift when they're moving towards us. Good luck.